You're tuned in to Strength Culture's Quantum Lifting Podcast. Brought to you by the team from Melbourne Strength Culture, the home of Australian strength training. Here are your hosts, Charlie Athanasiou and Jamie Smith. Three big uh, bulls. Big bulls, yeah. That will just do its intro. Welcome to the Strength Culture Presents Quantum Lifting Podcast, Chapter 57. The Christmas edition. The Christmas special. We were going to wear Santa hats, but forgot to get some. (laughs) How would you have gone wearing a Santa hat? You would have got around it? Yeah, I would have got around it. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> so we got we got Jacob Skeppis in today, all the way from the west. He's, fl- he's driven down. Flown down. Flown down. Uh, so obviously this podcast actually started during the week. These two having a bit of a discussion on hypertrophy. We had a D&M discussion. So we're like, why not come on the podcast and discuss? A, Did he have the nuts? He's got the, you've got the nuts to be here, and he's got the nuts to discuss with you. Yeah, I'm happy to facilitate a conversation and we're, we're open up some chat. Have a couple of conversations. I'm just going to sit here and faci- oh, I'm the facilitator. All right. I'm the facilitator. <laughs> I'm the, I'm the, the facilitator. So the first, well, we've got Jacob here. Do yeah, we'll intru- talk about yourself. Do you want to introduce yourself quickly to, to the people listening that don't already know who you are? Yes. Yeah, so my name's Jacob. I'm a strength and physique coach at JPS Health and Fitness. That's... Uh, my company that I co-founded with uh, my brother Sam. Uh, I've been personal training for nearly 10 years now. I uh, dabbled in bodybuilding, a bit of powerlifting, and very much interested in the science and application of building muscle, getting people stronger, uh, looking better, and all those sorts of things. Nice stuff. Nice. Well, my first question is, because I've actually, when we decided to get you on here, two, two days ago, which mm-hmm. wasn't a massive time, but was actually how JPS came about because you guys have been in business quite some time it's like eight years eight years yeah I think um, when I was 20 yeah so I was going to ask because you're only yeah you're 27 28 yeah 28 yeah, 28. 28 so you know quite young how did you what was the point that because I've heard his story of opening a business but I've never actually heard yours of starting a business and um, you know yeah, so having the nuts to do it yeah I was is this just before you go is this close enough do you want to just check the sound uh, looks like it. Yeah. It's picking, picking up some stuff. We can put it closer if you want. Yeah, crazy. Oh, sort of. Yeah, continue. Yeah, so like uh, most young kids out of high school, I was just trying to make some money. Um, I was working, I think it was three or four jobs at the time, and I was trying to crack into the VFL. Um, and to play. Yep. Yep. And personal training sort of popped up, did my cert three and four, and I was... Uh, already heavily into the gym and at that point had a lot of people asking how I like transformed my physique um because I went from like a pretty chubby average looking young fella um to to, and juicy no I wasn't jacked but I was just like yeah pretty lean got very good at starving myself um and people asked me to write them programs diets and things like that before I had my cert three and four uh so when I got my certs uh the gym pretty much that I was training at offered me a job yep and I took that by the balls ran with it and started coaching people and then uh, that was at recreation health uh, club in Essendon I built up to 30 or 40 clients in less than six months um, and then my best mate also did his uh, three and four he didn't want to do his own thing he said I'll work for you so I started giving him clients at the same gym Sam saw that we were both doing pretty well he's like I went one in on the action started building him up and before you knew it um, three of us had you know nearly or 100, 150 sessions a week between us. Um, and we're all paying rent. Yeah. So it just didn't make sense. Yeah. It got to the point where I was like, this is just not, you know, not sensible. And they wouldn't, um, you know, give us any kind of uh, deal or subsidize uh, any of our rent. Well, so. Oh, actually, no, I won't ask. I was going to ask what gym, but you probably. Well, I already right. said recreation. Recreation. I missed, I missed that. I missed that. I started a recreation. I missed that. And, um, yeah, so I was studying more, um, working various other jobs, slowly cut out all the other jobs and um, had saved up a bit of money and uh, went out on my own and rented a space and bought all the equipment and off we went and that was... Um, this is the same space you're still in? No, okay. so that was on Killer Road, that was a little shoebox and then built that up to, we had eight coaches at, at, towards the end and we are doing about 300 to 400 sessions a week out there. Um, it, was, it was pumping. That's good. It was like a little fucking nightclub. It was great. Yeah. And then you yeah. moved into the current facility. Yeah. So in, I sold my house. 
bought that property, moved everything across. Oh, so you own the property? Yeah. Uh, uh, and um, there's a reason McDonald's successful. Biggest real estate company in the world. Yeah. I watched, uh, what was the movie? The, uh, Starbucks as well. Yeah. What was the the founder? Mm. That's how he That's how he, he, he wolfed them out at the end because he bought the property, found a loophole in property law and that's yeah. how he, he somehow overtook their little business and turned into a multi-million It's million actually a really franchise. good franchise. Really good documentary. I would definitely it's recommend. A movie. movie. Yeah, or docu-movie <laughs> or whatever you want to call it. It's uh, The Founder. It's that's on Netflix. Good. I'd highly recommend it. I watched it going to Europe in 2017. On the way, it's good. Yeah, yeah, good memories. That's interesting. So I've never, I've never actually heard that that story. Yeah. Are you looking at staying in that current facility because you own it? Yes, and potentially expanding. Um, Next door. Sam and I, yeah. There's a couple of ideas we've been floating around. Um, we obviously had Port Melbourne, gave that a crack. Really bad timing on my end. I rushed it. I was just stubborn. Um, and said that I wanted to have a second facility when I did that. It was doing all right, like we were breaking even, um, had a good number of coaches out there, taking plenty of sessions, and it was growing steadily. Um, but I just had my second kid when we <laughs> opened that. Um, so it was, yeah, one of those uh, situations where I had to make some tough calls and prioritize the family. So oh. fortunate that we had the offer from one of my mentorship students one day out of the blue just said, you know, how much would you sell this for? I told him to get fucked originally. <laughs> and then, um, you know, told Sam, Sam's like, well, you want to get a house for the family? He's like, this is your... Let's cut the losses, yeah. This is your leg leg up. And then I was like, all right. So we did that. Um, and now, uh, the reason we did that was because we wanted to move into the online education space and take the mentorship online, um, do the UABC, all of our presenting, traveling, writing eBooks, creating content, things like that. So... Um, having two facilities as you guys can imagine running one yeah. um, is just a fucking nightmare for doing anything creative um, and working on the business you just become so heavily intertwined in the business and the day to day operations and managing you're just running around putting out spot fires you can't actually you know strategically plan and because we were just underpowered in terms of staff and uh, what not it was just uh, yeah true enough more than and then the other thing yeah. too that is you've got you've got kids mm. which two yeah beautiful guys. I couldn't even think about like how you do it mm. which is the other you know added stressor more in, internal load Jamie knows I'm losing my hair he's, yeah. he's, he's seen the photo he's seen the photo <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've been, uh, that is under wraps so that is that is locked away that yeah. photo in the wank bank <laughs> <laughs> which photos <laughs> I'll show you after if I get if I get the <laughs> yeah, approval. Pull it up. If I get the approval, you can put it on the don't screen. worry. I could send a photo out of the four hundred fucking grey hairs on both sides of my head. So don't, don't right. stress that. Well, do stress that. We'll okay. move on to the well, what we're here for to discuss hypertrophy. Mm-hmm. So you guys started discussing during the week. All right, so I put up the post about That's Crozier cool. and and our very Mike Tashira influenced bottoms up approach to programming. Yeah. Keep variables somewhat consistent and let it unfold. And then at the end of a block, make your decision and your assumption of what you predict to occur moving forward, make an adjustment and then just let it roll again. Rather than predicting, all right, we're going to go from 12 sets per week to 14 to 16 across this eight week block. Like Mm -hmm. it's just, we've found more success with our guys being a bit more reactive from end of block programming rather than preempting forward mm. that's sort of where, and then you came in with a couple of rebuttals and we had a bit of a discussion and then you were like do you want to just talk about this on the podcast mm. so I'm like fucking no let's talk about it on a podcast yeah and here we are at the Christmas special the Christmas special yeah yeah so I actually agree with a lot of what you've said now um, so I think the primary tenet of the post was to demonstrate that you keep variables fixed um, I've just got some notes here and I want to make sure I understand what you were arguing. Before we say that, if you want to find the post, it's the one of the screenshot of uh, like a, Jamie, a, a Jamie program. Get, oh, he, see, he's called Jamie, so it fucks it up. I was going to say, Jamie, get it up. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so I can, uh, I can, I'll share it. When we share this episode, I'll share the post, the, the photo of it again, but you can find it. This is on Instagram. I can put a, link. I can put a link in the... Uh, it's about 10 posts down. It's literally just the, the blue training template that we use here. I at can put a down. link in the uh, Instagram link. Yeah, yeah description description box box below. in the description yeah. box. We've been using the description mm-hmm. box. In the show notes. Below. Yeah. It works. Yeah, so I want to steel man your argument, make sure I understand it, and uh, 
ensure that we're on the same page. So I think the first point that you're making was that fixed variables allows for a better assessment of what works and what doesn't because there's less noise yep. um, within the program. Without a doubt. Um, second point was by holding reps, RP and sets fixed throughout a block, the athlete becomes their own science experiment uh, as the experiment allows for assessment of how they respond to the program, so that bottoms up approach. And the third is that that accounts for changes at the individual level and uh, not the program. Uh, meaning that the program can be adjusted based on response at the end of the cycle, um, not for arbitrary, predetermined, you know, overload Appli- for yeah. the sake of overload. prediction mm. of what's going to happen. Yeah, right. I think the only the only thing that may have been missed because another person did message me about the uh, the reps being set. Yeah. We do use a double progression. There is a range, but it's set within the range eight to ten or t- ten to twelve. Uh, so technically outside of main lift so like a squat a deadlift a bench press if they're utilized in a hypertrophy phase we can argue whether or not they're they're beneficial or not no I think for a powerlifting for a powerlifting there there, there definitely is utility there Um, they may not be fixed because we want to hold them within a oh is this actually progressing within the set range the, the set rep that we've set but everything outside of that generally follows a double progression where we'll have a range of 8 to 10 or 10 to 12 and depending on the the uh, the education of the athlete they would know when to progress and they will have some sort of decision making process to mm-hmm. alright today I'm going to progress or today I'm not going to progress yeah. Yeah. I even use bigger ranges than that yeah, well, depending like on how long the cycle and 10 is. 10 to 15 yeah. and just tell them to hit the prescribed RPE in that range, which we've discussed this before there's a couple of things to yeah, unpack there so the first is like really semantic um, and I think you don't need to say reps are fixed if there's a rep range because rep range fixes your reps to that range. So there's no need to say reps are fixed. Like my issue with that primarily, and I'll just be absolutely uh, 100% honest here, was that I felt that you were trying to be a little bit of a contrarian and put out your methods and pit that against, you know, your Mike Israel's, our methods that we would have posted online where we do change variables um, to say that we fix reps as well. Uh, when in actual fact, the, you use a rep range like what most of us do. So that was why I kind of had an issue there. Mine. Um, but the second point uh, on yep. that is that I agree with Charles that if we're, you know, working within the five to 30 rep range, the, the literature is pretty clear that, um, yeah, the stimulus for hypertrophy is quite similar in that range provided relative intensity thresholds met. So RPEs of, you know, five or more. Um, so having a bigger range, it doesn't really matter. And I think yeah. that the range oh, just That's what I do. Cause I the just- The ranges should be determined based on uh, the exercise in question. For example, if you're performing a lateral raise and you only have a repetition range of say two reps, um, if you add load once you've got to the top end of that range, uh, that fixed increment in load, if it's two kilos going from 10 to 20, uh, 10 to 12 kilos, that's a massive uh, yeah. increase that could push you below that 10 rep uh, range. So I think um, depending on the exercise, it's often a good idea to have wider ranges. I would agree that, with that. That's a, that's a side yeah. point. So the what, reason, I'll like, be completely honest, the reason I'm putting these posts out right now is we have seminars coming up so it is literally just uh hey, i knew it was a marketing tool yeah yeah all of everything as, that's why as, i called you out. yeah <laughs> nah, everything that we've had uh on instagram so it's not like a, oh we're putting this against other people's methods it's just like hey this is actually what we do this is why we do it if you're interested come to our seminars we can explain all of this in detail over a four five six hour period yeah. so it, it was never like a used to be like an no, attack I, I know it. i know that but I'm, i know yeah. there's a part of that that comes with marketing inherently yeah. It's like you have to have a point of difference. And that yeah, without a doubt, 100%. Yeah. So I guess where I agree, so I've got four areas um, where I agree with you is that number one, changing variables too frequently from week to week within a mesocycle makes measuring progress and assessing uh, their response uh, very difficult because there's too many moving parts. So I yeah. totally agree with that. Um, and number two, an individualized approach is superior to any generic predetermined you know, progression scheme. Um, especially with predetermined increases in, like, say, volume and intensity. I'm not a huge fan of the Israel eight sets, week one, 12 sets, 14 sets, you know, things like that. I think um, it's a little bit too assertive. And I think, um, yeah, just the fact that it's predetermined is, is an issue in and of itself. Um, and I think effective programming should make changes based on the individual's mm-hmm. points. Yep. Um, but there's a couple of points where I disagree uh, with the idea of fixed variables. Because I don't think that that's actually individualizing the approach. Uh, we'll speak more to this in a minute, I'm sure. And I think, in fact, if you if you say that we're fixing variables, you're violating the principle of individualization, because you're not allowing for dynamic adjustments um, and reactive changes to be made um, to the program, because it assumes that the predetermined variables, such as volume, will be optimal from start to finish of the mesocycle, and applies a dogmatic 
and rigid approach to whatever variable is fixed, right? And I think that contradicts your ethos of um, you know, individualization and auto regulation. And we know that individual readiness changes from session to session, week to week. Um, and RPE allows us to adjust our load. So why can't we have flexibility and a reactive approach to say sets? Sets per week. Sets yeah. per week to exercise selection. Because we know that for hypertrophy, it's a lot less specific than strength. Strength, it's you need- Stimulus specific. You need yeah. uh, exercise, rep range, loading zone, range of motion, joint angles. It's very specific. Hypertrophy is all about a stimulus. So for example, you don't even need to have a set exercise. You can say horizontal press of choice. Yeah. If you have an advanced athlete. We do, we do use that. So you strategy. don't need to fix variables. You don't even need to fix an exercise. Yeah. You don't need to fix sets. Um, I think... So you would... So uh, based off that premise... I'm just playing devil's advocate. Yeah, no, that's fine. I, I, we Believe us, we are, we are far in the range of challenge ideas, have big, bigger discussions, progress the, the entire consciousness of our... Mm. Uh, industry we're, together because we're, we're all we're all running our own little ships that ultimately are, are fighting the same battle. So we're a collective consciousness. We're a collective. Con- that's the word I was looking for. Um, so so started reading Daniel. Uh, I haven't. Man. I've got it here. I've got the notes here. I've because I've, I've, I'm I'm listening to the brain that changes itself currently. Back to it. I wanted to bring it up. Because, yeah. um, all right. So 100. percent We do use uh, horizontal roll of choice, one arm roll of choice, two arm roll of choice. Um, um, variation of choice, bicep, tricep, mm-hmm. whatever. So we do utilize that strategy depending on the person, depending on the context. It's all going to be context dependent. How would you go about uh, outside of educating a, a client? Obviously, like because there's there's multiple ways in which you can individualize a session for a person. You can mm-hmm. heavily restrict all of the variables to a point where it's it's four sets of ten this week at this load. Or we can individualize the load being now it's an RPE scale, you educate RPE scale, reps in reverse, reserve, however you want to educate on that. You can then loosen up the variable of reps. All right, now we have a rep range of 8 to 10, 8 to 12, whatever you want to do. You educate further. All right, if you're sitting at an RPE 9 here, it means we're probably not going to go up in load. We're just going to try and increase whatever, however you want to do that and educate your, your athlete through that process. How would you go about making sets a variable within a program? Because I've never so think, seen a variable I think set I think we're speaking at two strategy. different levels now. I think you're looking at it from the athlete's perspective where they have choice, whereas I was discussing it more so from the perspective of changing the program based on the individual's response as the message cycle progresses. So, so instead of saying, as you said, we have fixed sets, so 14 sets for quads week one, and we have 14 sets for quads at week five. Yeah. So I'm very much of the opinion that for hypertrophy, there is a range of stimulus that will elicit uh, a hypertrophic response. And that applies to not just uh, RPE. So if we're from RPE to five to 10, that there's a range there that's gonna apply stimulus uh, with varying degrees uh, in magnitude of that stimulus, uh, but also volume as well. So uh, I think there's a couple of issues uh, specifically to Will that we'll discuss shortly, but I think there's a range of volume that can work. And I think starting with a, an amount of volume that you think is most optimal in week one of a program uh, really limits your ability to overload the variable that has the strongest relationship to with hypertrophy, hypertrophy which is volume. volume. So I think uh, not only should volume be ramped up, not the whole way through uh, a la Mike Israel, I, I'm not a huge fan of that for reasons I said, I think it should be more auto-regulated, but I think having some uh, idea that, hey, we're gonna start on the low end of that range of what I think will work best for this person. We'll build that up over the first maybe two weeks, three weeks, uh, and then we'll hold that and we'll just see from there and we'll try to drive, um, you know, uh, overload in the relative intensity. So, you know, pushing our RPEs up a little bit more, yeah. training a little bit harder, um, and then letting progress come to us. And I think one of the big issues that a lot of people have, uh, particularly in the case of what you were describing in uh, that post, was that you are looking for performance assessments as your primary proxy for hypertrophy. If that is a hypertrophy block and your goal is hypertrophy, performance is all but one proxy for hypertrophy. And the accuracy at which performance improvements um, correlate with hypertrophy are chronic. They are not acute, right? So we need to look at more acute proxies for hypertrophy as opposed to performance. So over the course of mesocycle, I'm looking at things like, is there a perception of tension? Like can the athlete actually feel the tension? Um, And we know that you do one set, you feel a little bit, you do two, 
bit more, more, three. So if an athlete is in week three and they're like, hey, you know, I'm not really feeling much when I'm doing this, could probably do a little bit more. I'm gonna say no, but let's not add volume because I've already set your volume for week one. Definitely not. Add some volume, let's see. And that's all gonna play into how we progress relative intensity as well, what exercise it is, all those sorts of things. Um, but tension, perception, you know, the pump, yep. are they getting good pumps? Uh, muscle soreness, and then obviously performance improvements performance. being number four. But you're not gonna assess, but here's the kicker. Here's what everyone forgets with hypertrophy programs. In a hypertrophy program, you are training with higher volumes. What comes with higher volumes? What happens when there is a chronic transfer or increase in fitness adaptations? What, what comes with that gradual increase in fitness? Well, you need to increase fatigue, fatigue. fatigue. yeah, because you need- So what happens to performance acute volume? volume? It drops. It should drop. Well, it's not gonna progress. So if you're mm -hmm. using performance as your proxy for progress, if performance is actually going up, he might be able to do more volume because he's not training under enough fatigue. So it, you're not gonna change volume from week one to week five, performance is going up, it's working. I would actually say you're short, uh, you know, you're limiting. Keep talking. You just got, keep talking. I would say that you're limiting his progress by not increasing sets. Because if performance is going up that reliably, that quickly, and we'll talk about anabolic stimulus, yeah, uh, anabolics yeah, being yeah. another uh, you know variable thrown into the mix there, um, I think that there's a range of sets, uh, set number per week per muscle group that is going to provide a very potent stimulus for hypertrophy. And I think that you know you start on the lower end, you work towards the middle top end of where you think that uh, you know upper limit might be towards uh, the middle of the cycle and you hold it there, you try to progress uh, on that as much as you can. But in many cases, especially when you throw in uh, anabolics uh, or someone who does have a very uh, you know, stress-free, consistent, um, tightly controlled lifestyle, sleep, nutrition, all those sorts of things, um, you know, often manipulating volume is as uh, predictable as manipulating intensity. You know, you know when you have those athletes, how you, you know you can add five kilos. Yeah. Every week, you know, it's like the same thing for sets. And I think uh, when it comes to your average person, general population, where there's a lot more moving parts and their neurological, neurobiological backdrop is, you know, a lot more uh, undulating and fluctuating from week to week, I think, yes, adding sets can be um, deleterious in many cases because um, you're just throwing fucking shit at a wall hoping it sticks. Yeah. Um, but I definitely think as with uh, any good program, it should be, any adjustment should be made based on um, you know, the coach's experience and knowledge of what changes are gonna to lead to the most uh, optimal outcome and the likelihood and probability of that outcome happening um, and obviously the athlete and how they're gonna to respond to that. So I think, yeah, there's a lot to be said when it comes to having sets fixed. Um, I, I don't see why it can't work. Um, it can, but I think there's a better way. Uh, and I think that um, putting yourself in a box where you say that I fix sets, um, because that's how we do it and we just look at performance and based on performance changes over this five weeks We then determine whether volume goes up. It's like Yeah, but you do that over three blocks. There's six, you know um, Say there's six weeks in a block five weeks up in a deload um, You know, there's 18 weeks and fuck you could be really pissing up a lot of time against the wall and limiting your athletes gains so That's my thoughts on that. There's a couple of other things we get into. But yeah, definitely. Oh, I was gonna ask because your the post yesterday and that meta analysis account minimum effective dose. Yeah. So I'm not a volume fucking you know advocate. I just look to what I think is going to work best in the situation. I think in some cases, yes, holding sets constant is a great idea. Like I said, if someone's got too many moving parts outside of the gym, it's like you just don't need to fuck around with um, you know those kind of variables. Variables. But, um, you know when you do have someone who's pretty consistent with their training schedule, their sleep, their nutrition, all that kind of stuff. Um, I think for hypertrophy, given the dose response relationship with hypertrophy, meaning the more volume is better up until a point, um, go up to that point. Like, yeah, push and to, find that point. Yeah, find that point. Definitely. And then, yeah. and, so and, and, at what point then would you, so if you've set, we'll use your 14 quad sets per week as your starting point and you'll hold that for a, a block. How would you progress that? Where, at what point do you say this is now the limit? How do you find that point? Like I said, those proxies. Tension perception, soreness. So once, once all of that if, has, so if, soreness will, will if soreness is high, and we see performance decrements in two to three sessions, provided there's no confounding variables such as like sleep, stress, yep. things like that. If performance uh, in two subsequent sessions has starts been, to regress, 
we've you're hit, doing too much. We've hit our, we've hit hit our, hit we've hit our recoverable That's, That was going to be my question too. Yeah. It's like, how do you... And, and yeah. many times you don't fucking know. No, but, yeah, no, but if the athlete yeah. is recovering, and like I said, so when it comes to measuring hypertrophy, there are proxies, right? They're the things that we know have you know some uh, relationship with hypertrophy some, yeah. in, in a practical setting that we can use to say, hey, if we're getting these things, it's probably a good idea because... You know, chances are we're getting some stimulus for growth, right? Um, but what do we actually want? We want increases in fiber cross-sectional area. Yeah. Like that's the end goal. So if you're looking for hypertrophy and you're just using one of those four proxies and you're not measuring hypertrophic outcomes, which I don't know whether or not you are, but you should be, and it's very hard to get a muscle biopsy, so I don't expect people to do that. Very hard to get your access, uh, your hands on ultrasound, so I don't expect people to do that. But you need to be looking at hypertrophy. So how do you know if your athletes are getting bigger? Right? Like you don't need to answer that now, but for me, I use girth measurements, right? So circumference measurements, I use visuals and scale weight. Mm. So I compare their, their visuals with their scale weight to see if any increases in body weight could be due to fat gain if they start looking sloppy and with the girth measurements. So I triangulate, which is um, what they use in the scientific uh, research uh, when they're trying to better understand a phenomenon and assess an outcome, they bring, bear about more measurement techniques um, to fill in the gaps, so to speak, for, yeah, for sure. potential flaws. And, so um, what are typical areas? You say arms, quads, Yeah, chest. arms, quads, waist, because if they're getting fat, that's the first yep. place uh, yep. you, know, you see girth increases. Um, so yeah, quads, arms, chest, waist. And how often do you take those? Four weeks, six weeks, um, weeks? Generally, every second mesocycle. It's one of those things. Um, so like eight to 10 weeks, eight yeah. to 12. Yeah, eight to 12 weeks. Um, and that's when you can do your visuals, uh, tracking body weight, averages over the course of weeks, you assess month to month. Um, and then at the end of those, you know, eight to 12 week period, you look at all the data, you say, okay, that's a better time frame in my opinion than just at the block based on one proxy of hypertrophy, which is performance. And you look at performance at that 12 week period and you say, hey, has your performance in the moderate rep range with X amount of volume because you've got to compare apples to apples. Yeah, definitely. If you're comparing you know, your performance when you're doing 14 sets of quad work versus your performance when you're doing five sets of quad work, well, fuck, I'd hope your performance with five sets be better, is significantly better. Yeah. You're doing right? a third of... So yeah. you're peaking, basically. Two thirds right? less So you've got to make sure that you're comparing apples to apples yeah. Yeah. Um, and looking at those things. So, so when, when yeah. you look at all that, I think uh, there's no reason why we can't have a more dynamic approach and change in the variables, whether it's uh, relative intensity. I think relative intensity has been strongly uh, and very high, um, high degree of confidence that it is causative of muscle growth. So if you are starting with an RPA and you hold an eight all the way through, it's like, I think you're leaving gains on the table. I think you should be starting at maybe a seven and you move up to a zero, yeah. particularly for your isolation exercise. So, and I think that's a very, very um, good way to overload. And I think in some cases you can't determine progress with progression because it, that's progression, increasing uh, you know, relative intensity. It doesn't mean that progress has occurred because you, they could just be training harder. Mm -hmm. But again, that's why at the end of 12 weeks, you look at all the variables and you discern was progress made in light of that progression. And that's where I think you can progress many variables provided there's some forethought, justification and rationale behind it and it's based on the individual response, which is what I agree with uh, your original points. Um, and instead of looking at just performance at the end of five weeks, you look at all of those uh, strongly correlated variables to hypertrophy that are gonna measure that outcome a lot better than just performance. Um, and there's no reason why you can't uh, have progression in, in multiple variables, especially the one that is most strongly correlated to hypertrophy being volume uh, throughout the mesocycle, so. Yeah, without a doubt. There's a, there's a lot of mirrored uh, concepts there in turn. And I think this is some low hanging fruit that a lot of coaches miss, like tracking body weight, um, block to block or month to month and seeing the percentage increase is within the range that you're looking for, uh, like photos and all that sort of stuff. Is it definitely ways in which you can identify whether or not the program is working? Um, I would still sit with, just from our experience, that having our set prescription, let it play out, and then progress. And if you, do, if you are within those ranges... So let me ask you this. If somebody <laughs> is sore and their performance is declining at, say, week three of a program, they've got a six-week program before a deload, and their performance is declining, they're sore, they're getting aches, would you reduce volume? Uh, if, if that was the only if that was the only alarm bell, only red flag, I probably wouldn't. I would adjust something within the program. I would I would assess other variables. I would measure other variables. And, and so, so why is volume a variable that you wouldn't adjust? 
I'm not. I'm not sure why that's. It, it potentially would be. We know that there's a dose response with pr- pretty much everything is a dose response. How much you give somebody affects the outcome, positively or negatively. Mm-hmm. It's not just volume in itself. It could be a relative range, uh, a, a relative intensity. Um, so how hard they're working within the set prescription. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could be a, a whole number of magnitude of, of volume of uh, uh, variables. Sorry, that could be influencing that outcome of being additionally sore throughout that block. Volume would be one of the things that we would look at 100%. But if our block to block progression of volume has been what we would deem to be ex- within the acceptable range of, of progress and it has been well adapted to so far, it probably may not be one of the things. It could be an exercise selection. So what if thing. mid-cycle, someone, for example, um, you know, their, their mum goes to hospital, they have to go to hospital and they can't train with the, you know, the regular time period that they would otherwise allocate. Um, and volume obviously is the primary factor that influences how long your sessions take because the more sets 100% you do, would drop yeah. volume. So, so you would change volume? In that context, I would. But so if somebody is just presenting with, hey, my quads are extra sore, like that extra soreness could be exercise selection, it could be the volume, it could be the relative intensity. That you, can make that argument, you can make that argument for every variable. Exactly, so, you could. So, so it's going to be one of the things we would look at. Without a doubt, volume is. It's the, it's the amount of the stimulus you're giving somebody. 100%, it is one of the biggest variables that you can manage. Mm. But it's not just going to be the first thing I look at. I'm not just going to be like, not. you're sore, drop volume. No, or no, you're but, feeling but, good, no, no, but, more but, volume. But you have to remember that there's assumptions built into every... Um, you know, potential rationale behind our adjustments to program. If I'm adjusting volume, there is the assumption that technique is good, that they didn't overshoot load selection, that sleep is good, that nutrition is good, that stress is low. Uh, if soreness is then high, then I am left to adjust volume. It's, 100%. It's, it's, it's in, that, like, in that context, correct, you've just presented correct. 100%. So, so let's make sure that we're, we're speaking on the same page because I would not just increase or decrease volume just because someone's sore. There, there are so many other factors, you know, uh, loading on a stretch, if they uh, actually, you know, improve their technique and they start getting a longer range of motion, uh, for whatever reason, they could be pausing longer in their, in their pec flies, whatever it is, and they fucking say that they're sore, or they train with a friend and their friend pushes them a little bit harder and they, you know, pull up sore from that. Um, you know, I'm not gonna use soreness as the only indicator, but it is an indicator when all other variables are hard. Uh, are controlled, yeah, and, and, that, and that's where we need to make sure that when we're looking at adjusting volume, if all other variables are held constant, and I would assume that they would be for Will because he fucking lives, breathes, and eats iron. Not, not necessarily. Well, I would assume would, that's... That's uh, an assumption, but it doesn't quite play out in that, particularly with some lower body exercise selections that we have to deal with from previous injuries and all that sort of stuff. But I'm talking about lifestyle management stuff. Lifestyle management, 100%. But right. in terms of the training program, it actually is quite a variable, almost like a, a week-to-week, day-to-day basis of, all right, we need to try this, we need to try this, because... There are some previous injuries that we are dealing through, mm. and I think so. It sounds like nothing in Will's program is really fixed. If you're working around injuries, you're going to make changes on the go, uh, because that sounds like nothing's actually. So yeah, we try really to fixed. fix the variables that we can. Would you Would you mean that you you probably put parameters on the variables and you say that well, this is the kind of range? Well, yeah, definitely. Variables? I would. Yeah. So I think that's a better way to say it rather than we then fix reps, fix. we fix RP, we fix. It's like. Well, there are per- parameters. It's like you never know if you got an RPA. Hey, it's like no, come it's on, sure, man. Uh, it's like it was it's, it's like it's like parameters. It's like are we in five to ten? You know, RPE. Yeah. That's the parameter. That's, are we yeah. within X volume? That's the parameter. It's like I think for parameters, um, that's a better way to advocate uh, how you design a training program. It's like we have parameters um, which we know with great degree of confidence are going to likely work for this individual uh, as long as we stay within those parameters. Whether we go to the low end or the high end. You're still within the parameters it's, of what will work, and especially for hypertrophy. Yeah. It's a stimulus, um, and we're looking at a, a you know a, a mechanical stimulus that converts into a chemical signal um, that increases muscle protein synthesis, um, turns on all those anabolic processes that uh, leads to increases in muscle cross-sectional area. I think, um, yeah, what we often forget is that that range of stimulus is not uh, static. It is not a fixed target it is a moving target based on the wild fluctuations in an individual's neurobiological back, uh, backdrop and i think that as a result of that we need to be open-minded to you know programming within parameters and say hey fuck you can do more let's do a little bit more because we know that that's going to build your muscle or hey you know maybe you're doing a little bit too much let's pull it back a little bit and i don't necessarily think that those changes need to be left 
purely for the end of a block. I think you should be making those assessments uh, during the block. I think the assessments you make at the end of a block, which in actual fact is like multiple mesocycles strung together, uh, scale weight, visuals, yeah, yeah. girths, yep. and overall performance. That, that's a real assessment for hypertrophy. It's not the end of block. So you, so you don't you don't take any of those measures. So the only measures that you have throughout a training block that you may Saunas, make uh, your- Perception of tension, uh, pump, and obviously they record their load um, and their performance. And are you, are you capping, so again, we'll use quads. Are you capping, hey, I want you to measure or, or manage your quad set, but I don't want you to go from 15 this week to 22 next week or something I, like I that. I don't give them, you they, don't, give they them don't make range. those choices. The only time I give um, a range of sets uh, is if I have an athlete who is dieting and they haven't um, dieted before and they're not exactly sure how their performance is gonna play out and what kind of volumes I they need. Ask. So I'll give them the choice of say, hey, if you're feeling okay in this session, go up to four sets, you know, for, for, for leg press, whatever it is. If you feel really fucking shit because you're doing a lot of yeah, cardio, sleep shit, you're in a deficit, pull it back, we can do three sets. Yeah, I was gonna ask that because obviously that's something- Because that's, that's a huge just... difference. But then we're no longer training for hypertrophy anymore. We're trained to preserve yeah, yeah, muscle yeah, yeah, and yeah. we need far less of a stimulus. So we don't have the you know environment, uh, the physiological mm -hmm. environment to support um, you know higher training volumes. In, in actual fact, it's like you your minimum effective volume when you're dieting goes up. The amount of work you need to do to maintain your muscle uh, goes up because you have such a um, potent catabolic, catabolic signal stimulus, yeah. as, as a result of an energy deficit, cardio, and all of those things. But your maximum recovery volume comes down. So the window is actually the a lot smaller. Change, yeah. So you need to arm the athletes uh, you know, with a little bit more um, autonomy over how much work they do because at the end of the day, um, you know, when we throw in calorie deficit, cardio, sleep disturbance, the stress that comes with dieting and the restraint process, um, all of a sudden, you know, performance can change day to day. You give someone a refeed, before they've even eaten the food, their mood improves and they have a fucking great session. They feel good, they hit top, top end of the <clears throat> set ranges. But you, know, you make a calorie adjustment, that they've had a fucking shit week, they have a fight with the missus because they can't go out for dinner. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, they're going to the bottom end of that set range, but it's still enough to, you know, preserve. Preserve. That was because I was going to ask the question about how does this differ for you when you, especially with guys deep into a lot of bodybuilding prep, but mm. obviously there's, we're talking about hypertrophy, whereas here we're talking about preserving mm. the goal, just to preserve what you've built in the off season. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah and sense. yeah, sometimes like, and it's all context dependent, as we know. It's like there are some athletes where I would not give them a range of sets. Well, this, um, this would be gonna... my, in terms of, so we understand like the dieting phases, uh, like deep into a dieting phase for a bodybuilding comp would be com a completely different context. Mm -hmm. But let's, let's uh, at least ref define it within a, a powerlifting sense, somebody going up a weight class. Um, and how would you equip the athlete to be able to make the necessary and at least educated call to, hey, I'm feeling good, I'm going to increase sets. Because I'm assuming you're not sitting there with every single athlete of every single session. No. So Sorry. there's got to be some sort of like a decision tree where it's, all right, this is a good time for me to add more quad sets. Yeah. So first would be uh, exercise selection. So you would confine it purely to um, accessory exercises, yeah, like, yeah, isolation yeah. exercises. I would not advise that um, on a, a main lift, like a squat, bench press or deadlift. Uh, second would be where is when is that adjustment being made by the athlete in the context of the overall program is a week one is a week four is a week five like how close are they to deloading if it's closer to deloading and towards the end of a training cycle and they feel like they've recovered uh they feel like they're not overly sore and that doing another set will actually be productive in the sense that they'll be able to main, maintain performance uh, relative to the prior sets um, and it's not going to overreach them in the sense that uh, it will cause too much fatigue that they'll dig a recovery hole they won't be able to climb out of. You know, if they're doing fucking leg extensions or bicep curl, lateral raise. Um, hey, why not? I, I can't, I can see more reasons why that would be an okay or good decision. A positive, yeah. Than it being a bad decision. Mm. Yeah, towards the so back it's end like, of the it's block, like, it's like Unless yeah. you can find reasons uh, to argue otherwise, I'm very much inclined to say that, that that's probably you know, a better decision than doing what was prescribed if the athlete feels that um, yeah, they want they to. Could more, they, yeah, they, they could achieve more, yeah, they could achieve more. There's a, the, 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 the psychological benefit of, I, I felt I left something on the table. And it also, it also um, you know, starts to develop 
um, autonomy and it gets the athlete thinking about their training and they start to feel a sense of ownership over their program, uh, which can be quite which a... Which you know is a positive for yeah, all outcomes, yeah. really. And yeah. it just uh, yeah builds trust that you're willing to listen to them, um, that you're willing to give them a little bit of uh, ownership and control over executing the program. And most uh, late intermediates, advanced athletes, uh, you know, really like that. Um, they like feeling a part of the decision-making process. And, you know, if we look at, um, you know, managing, managing athlete outcomes and outcome expectancy, uh, one of the best things that coaches can do, and they've looked at this in Olympic research, um, you know, is focus on collaborating with the athlete rather than, um, you know, predetermining, you know, the plan, the goals and all these things. It's like collaborate, work, um, you know, communicate, have an open dialogue and give the athletes some responsibility for the decisions they make in relation to their training, their goals and those sorts of things. Without a doubt. 100%. Yeah, they are adults, so, you know, you've got to treat. We're not, sometimes. We're not, sometimes. We're not, yeah. Is Stoops an adult? Would you say he's an adult? Stoops an adult. He's an adult. <laughs> he's far more adult now than he used to be. He's, he's, he's doubt. He's matured. He's running yeah. his business and he's maturing fast. He's hustling. maturing. He's a hustler. He's hustling. <laughs> he's definitely hustling. A big hustler. Uh, well, You're not going to ask me this, are you? What? Why do we train? Yeah, I wanted to get your answer. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to repeat it as well as I did that night. No, it was. It was. Okay, we'll finish on that. That was. Because yeah, right. well, yeah, is there anything else that I, I think it was a very? Uh, there's a lot of take homes there for for sure. Actually, yeah, some. Let's sum it let's up sum quickly it up. to give whoever's listening just some key points to go right because we just rambled for 30 minutes. I had one other really important point. By the way. Oh, mate. Well, if you want to. Yep. So the final one is athletes are not a science experiment. Um, as exercise science is an applied science. And I think, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, there's, there's three types of experiments. There's controlled, natural, and field experiments. So when we say experiment, um, the typical definition of that is a controlled experiment, where it's in the lab, where you are able to determine cause and effect and manage and manipulate various factors and variables. Things, yeah. Right. When we move to natural experiments, all of a sudden we're observing uh, phenomena in the real world with many variables we can't account for. Um, so I think that again, uh, when we take um, you know program design and we put it in the context of a natural experiment, um, we need to be far more flexible um, with how we program. And I think that's where having fixed variables would work in a controlled experiment, but not a natural experiment. And that's why I think parameters is a far better. Uh, you know, conceptual uh, understanding of program design. And the other thing on that is that when we have uh, any experiment, if we have two variables that are highly correlated to an outcome, uh, and both of those variables are in the mix when we're looking at determining cause and effect, how do we discern what's causing which what? One, which we one can't. And that was yeah. my argument with Will. How do you know what's causing growth? Is it the anabolics or is it the training stimulus? And you don't know that because they're conflated. So I think that that is a, a really important consideration. Mm. Obviously, not one that naturals uh, need to have, but when you're working with enhanced athletes, uh, it's often very difficult, and that's why I think you need to have a really, really fucking good understanding of hypertrophy um, to be able to best detect, um, you know, the stimulus versus the um, you know changes in physiological state. Yeah, yeah. the physiological state based on the exogenous hormones. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, without doubt. Cool. So why do we train? Oh man, I need to do this. What, why, do, why do we train? We have basic biological needs that we need to satisfy um, as a species, which are find mate, retain mate, uh, avoid predator, avoid poisonous food, find nutritious food, invest in kin, and build coalitions. And I think that uh, evolutionary biology um, has shown that natural selection and sexual selection play a very big role in uh, economic behaviours uh, and behaviours in general of the human race. And for the most part, when we reach adolescence and our early to teenage, uh, teenage to early 20s, um, all of a sudden, sexual selection becomes a big priority. And there is uh, a lot of research that's shown that men have a preference for women with uh, an hourglass figure. They've actually researched uh, men who are congenitally blind, so they've never seen a day of light in their life, and they'll get them to do a field test of a woman with the hourglass figure versus a woman straight up and down, and men, every time, choose the hourglass okay. figure. So that uh, preference in the opposite sex, uh, I think, has played a large part in why we resistance train. 
um, because obviously we can change our aesthetics and aesthetics are a big factor in the sexual selection process, particularly for men when they're selecting women. Um, when women select men, they do prefer, they have shown preference for the, the taper, the V-taper. However, the, the evolutionary cost, the biological cost of um, procreation for a woman is far greater than it is for a man. It takes me 30 seconds and I've had a kid, you know? Um, but for a woman, they get impregnated, nine months carrying the baby, plus labor, yeah. plus 10, 20 years looking after kids. So their preferences are not only aesthetic driven, they're also related to you know, status, power, competency. ability to protect, competency, all of these Longer sorts of term things. Value. Correct, correct. Yeah. So uh, some differences there. But I think for the most part, we get into lifting to attract the opposite sex. Uh, as a result of that, over time, we realize that's a fucking hard process. We start to change our values because all of a sudden we realize that competency, um, you know, education and all these and career start to help us attract the opposite sex more than how we look. Mm. Um, so we devalue training a little bit. So we stop training for bodybuilding. We start doing powerlifting. Uh, this is my experience uh, with a lot of my athletes anyway. Um, but then we, we start to use training to satisfy other uh, elements of life and solve other problems that we now face uh, as a result of technological advancements. So we now have agriculture, we now have technology, we don't have to hunt and gather for food. So we're not uh, expending energy and you know feasting and famining. We are exposed to a very obesogenic environment. So now resistance training and exercise uh, serves a different purpose, not only for sexual selection, but uh, maintaining and fighting off um, you know, disease, maintaining health and fighting off disease, uh, but also building coalitions. So it gives us a sense of connection to other people, which is really important um, for obviously well-being. Um, it gives a sense of purpose when belonging. you go to the gym, belonging, relatedness, all of those things, and yeah, becoming competent um, and mastering the physical body, uh, you know, your physical attributes as well as your mental attributes. I mean, the challenges of coming to the gym, uh, I think, are very empowering and they have great transfer to other areas in life and people start to realize that, they become hooked. And I think that uh, humans are pleasure seeking, um, you know, animals and we get pleasure out of punishing our body because I think some of us have a little bit of a sadistic nature. There's a um, the spectrum so yeah. of pain and pleasure. I just read a book called The Other Side of Happiness. It talks all about this and that happiness often or joyful experiences often sprout in the times of painful experiences and that they, yeah. you know, the, there's a fine line between ple pleasure and pain. You can't have one. So without, after sufferings, there is yeah, pleasure. You can't have one without the other. So it's ignorant to think that you can chase this end goal of pure happiness when um, pain has to come along for the ride. They mm -hmm. both have to be there. And the deeper you can feel one actually means relatively speaking, you can feel the other one even more. Um, so it was, yeah, it was, it was that's funny that you said that because that's the whole book that I just read. So that's really cool. Well read. What was the book? It's called The Other Side of Happiness. Of happiness. Yeah. Looking yeah, I'll be looking into this one. Did I answer that as well that, as I did? That was good. One? I reckon that was almost better. Really? I hope it was better. <laughs> it was good. It was good. I, I, no, I liked it. Well, we, we often talk, we, we used to say as well when we were 16, why do you get in the gym to look better? Because you want to attract chicks. You go through that elegant process of defining the variables and stuff. My, why do we live? Find food and fuck. That's literally what I boil it down to. Yeah, pretty much. I've never That's thought about, <laughs> though, that obviously... I liked your little explanation of that we also train to, to some form of physical mm. um, because we, we obviously lack that in today's society where we're, a lot of people are potentially stuck in offices um, and we've evolved to move Correct. and do things and be active. Feels good. Locomotion is... And, you know, you know we obviously get a quite a... Is, yeah. You feel an element of ecstasy Apes. after training that, you know, dopamines, opioids, whatever they are. That, that was actually in the book as well. Mm -hmm. That, um, yeah, you feel good. And you lack that sitting at a desk all day staring at a LED light. It's true. So, yeah. Good oh, no, lockers, was... mate. Change the world. Yeah, you still don't. One screen, at, one screen at a time. I've never, I've never worn it. Yeah, me. I've never worn it. <laughs> I was going to say, I think worn. you're the kind of guy who had I got it. I got it. Do, do, do they make any change to anything? You, you wear them, and then you take them off, and you're, oh, right, the right. light destroys your eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one of those things. It's like you don't notice the humming in the, until it's turned off. Yeah, all right. It's like you don't notice how bright everything is until you put those on for half an hour, take them off, and it's like the walls look blue. Crazy. Um, so, yeah. Crazy. 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 <laughs> no, I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that, that definition of why we lift, why we train. Thanks, man. <laughs> That's good. I'm good. Anyway, well, um, I think we've gone. 
50 minutes. 50 minutes. Flew by. So we'll wrap it up there. Um, thank you for coming on, having yeah, that thanks, discussion. Thank you. If people want to find you, if they're interested in learning more about hypertrophy or anything that you spoke yeah. about today, where can they find you? Uh, JPS Health and Fitness is our website. Uh, JPS Education is the sister company of JPS, which is responsible for, as the name suggests, all of our education stuff. So we have an online mentorship course, uh, we have seminars uh, in various states uh, in 2020, um, and we put out a lot of free educational content on our blog, on our YouTube channel, as well as the Instagram page itself. So if you follow that one, you'll uh, be sure to stay up to date with all things JPS. Perfect. Well, I think we'll wrap it up there then. Thank you for listening to this episode. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. This will come out next Thursday. Which will be Boxing Day. Boxing Day. So Boxing Day. Merry special. Christmas anyway. Happy New Year. Season's greetings. And we'll see you in 2020. New decade. New era. Crazy. New things for wow. JPS and strength culture. 2020. Big. Let's go.